So, I just watched AMC's interview with the vampire and... I'm in a glass case of emotion! For anyone who was not watching the final season of Better Call Saul last summer and was unaware, AMC released a new adaptation of Anne Rice's foundational work, Interview with the Vampire, which follows a young man's transformation into a vampire and subsequent journey throughout the decades as he reckons with his own nature as a creature of the night. Leading up to its release, there was a lot of anticipation and skepticism. Personally, as a fan of all things vampire and this book in particular, I have so many feelings about this show. And while I know it's common to begin video essays with broad claims like this, I'm kind of just relieved that I do have enough feelings about this show to want to make an entire video essay about it. I think in the midst of all the discourse around the show, people have kind of forgotten how easy it would have been to really mess this up. It could have continued languishing in development hell, been an unimaginative carbon copy of the original film, or a full-length movie with Jared Leto as Lestat. It's Morbin time. So the fact that both the series' successes and failures as an adaptation have inspired me to want to impact this story and these characters that I've dearly loved for years is, honestly, kind of a relief. And I'm happy to feel this level of renewed investment and excitement for a franchise that has not typically fared well when it came to adaptations. Lestat, coming to Broadway. And that is what I want to focus on in this video, adaptation. How the series works from the perspective of adaptation, why certain changes were made, what worked about some, and what didn't work about others. See, this is a franchise with a lot of history, and a television adaptation was never going to be easy, faithful or not. In addition to the extensive world building and lore, there's also the issue of how to frame and depict the vampires themselves, a figure with its own extensive lore and myriad iterations throughout history. So the original book Interview with the Vampire, while subversive in its characterization of the vampire as both evil yet conflicted, kind of ended up changing the game for how vampires were depicted in mainstream media, with the broody, sensitive qualities that once made them subversive inevitably resulting in shallow surface-level replications before descending into self-parody. So in addition to the series having to make changes for a modern audience, a lot of which I think were well done, the series had to figure out what the vampire would now represent amidst these changes, all while staying true to a nearly 50-year-old property. Some readers may wonder what would be the point of analyzing adaptational changes given how wildly the show veers away from the original text, but here's the thing, the show still had a template of the original story that it was working from. The series can certainly be analyzed as a self-contained work, but part of the appeal of watching the series as an adaptation was seeing what was and wasn't retained about Rice's original text, and what that meant for this new iteration. So in the promotion for the show, there was a lot of talk from the writers and actors that while they would be doing their own thing, it would still stay true to the spirit of Rice's work and would be more faithful to the books in some ways. Lindsay Ellis did a great video recently about the Lord of the Ring film adaptations and how phrases like spirit of the original text is kind of bandied around a lot for adaptations despite the fact that what that means is fundamentally different for people because interpreting a text is such a subjective thing due to the influence of paratexts and the changing attitudes with which a reader might receive it in different times. A 19-year-old me reading the first book my freshman year of college in 2015 is probably going to have a very different experience with it to a reader in 1976. Hell, Anne Rice herself has gone on to retcon things in her own series based on her own changing perspective and attitudes. So I say all of this to argue that how Interview with a Vampire is read and interpreted is going to be an ever-changing thing. And this video will be an analysis of what adaptational changes do and don't work when it comes to reimagining this story for a 2022 audience. Also, I want to disclose that as a white cishet woman, there are elements to this adaptation that are outside of my frame of experience, so I highly recommend you check out James Summerton's episode breakdowns, as well as Michael Simeon's from Black Gay Comic Geeks. Also, Alyssa Hansen from Maven of the Eventide is pretty much an expert on all things Anne Rice and Vampire Chronicles, and her episode recaps were a huge resource while writing this video. So, with all that being said, let's talk about this beautiful, flawed, and ambitious adaptation. So, interview with the vampire. How long have you been in production? Anne Rice's Interview with the Vampire was published in 1974. Inspired by a short story Rice had written, the novel follows Louis Dupont du Lac, a plantation owner in 18th century Louisiana who, after the death of his brother Paul, becomes suicidal and self-destructive as he believes Paul's death is partially his fault. Louis meets a mysterious French nobleman named Lestat, who offers to take away Louis's pain and give him a dark gift. 
this being to become a vampire. After Lestat turns Louis, Louis wrestles with his new vampiric impulses all the while, clashing with Lestat, whose libertine nature and bloodlust seems to be only matched by his cruelty. The rest of the novel follows Louis' existential search for meaning as his vampire nature alienates him further and further from his humanity. The novel was written while Rice was recovering from a tragedy in her own personal life, and the state of her mind during this time is strongly reflected in her writing. This is not a vampire story with blood and gore, but a deeply personal exploration of morality, loss of faith, and an existential desire for meaning. Rice has been quoted as saying, The vampire is an outsider. He's the perfect metaphor for those things. He's someone who looks human and sounds human, but is not human, so he's always on the margins. The novel perfectly encapsulates this, and Louis' character, the vampire, the monster, becomes a sympathetic figure as the reader comes to know him and his struggles. While the series received an initially mixed critical response, Rice would write a sequel, The Vampire Lestat, eight years later, pivoting the focus to Lestat, who would become the series' protagonist, fundamentally changing the direction of this franchise, spawning multiple successful books, which would become The Vampire Chronicles. With the success of these books and Rice's now prolific fame as a writer, Interview with the Vampire would be adapted into a critically and commercially successful film by Neil Jordan in 1994, with a much less successful adaptation of The Queen of the Damned following in 2002. More. Yeah, so this film bombed big time, effectively killing any hopes for a Vampire Chronicles big screen franchise. The Vampire Lestat would do the same for musicals about vampires. It wasn't until 2015 that word spread of a new film adaptation of Interview with the Vampire, with the script being written by Anne Rice's son, Christopher. Rice would eventually decide the books were better suited to television, with a bidding war beginning and the rights being passed from Paramount Television Studios to Hulu before eventually being purchased by AMC Networks in May 2020, with Rice and Christopher set as executive producers. Roland Jones was brought on as a showrunner and was known as a writer for such prestige dramas as Weeds, Boardwalk Empire, and Friday Night Lights? Oh my god, can can I please get an episode where Lestat and Louis go to Dylan to see the Panthers play? Casting announcements began in mid-August of 2021, with Jacob Anderson being cast as Louis, Sam Reed as Lestat, and Bailey Bass as their vampire daughter, Claudia. In the lead-up to the show's premiere, expectations were mixed, to put it kindly. There was a lot of uproar from fans when it was announced that the series' timeline would be altered from late 18th century New Orleans to early 20th century New Orleans. This came about from Roland's desire to alter Louis' backstory as a white Creole plantation owner, a characterization he found would be off-putting to a modern audience, and instead have him be a black Creole man who is a brothel owner. Jones stated, the changes made were partially the result of wanting to focus on a time period that was as exciting aesthetically as the 18th century was without digging into a plantation story that nobody really wanted to hear now. So the decision to make Louis a black man and brothel owner received mixed reactions, with some of it just being good old-fashioned racism and other criticisms being more valid, such as the fear of Louis perpetuating the black pimp stereotype. Worries that the show wouldn't address issues of racism in a nuanced way, or how Louis' race would alter his dynamic with Lestat, who is a white man. Other changes such as interviewer Daniel Malloy's age, the reframing of the context for the interview, and Christopher Rice's lack of involvement all started to seem like red flags, worrying fans that this adaptation would veer too far from the source material and would be unable to retain the original story's themes. The series went into production in December of 2021 before completing in August of 2022 and was shot in New Orleans, with certain settings from the book such as Louis and Lestat's house on the Rue Royale in the French Quarter being shot on location. Other settings such as the now-gone red light district of Storyville were constructed by production designer Mara Lepere Schloop. The first trailer was released at Comic-Con in July 2022, with AMC doing extensive promotion with TV spots peppered throughout your Better Call Saul viewings for the next few months, before premiering in October. So after the years of production hell, the gnashing and wailing of teeth over adaptation changes, the anticipation and dread, I finally watched it and it was pretty good. Definitely veers pretty far from the source material and I don't agree with every change, but overall I'm optimistic and curious to see where it goes. Video over. Thanks for watching. Just kidding. So right off the bat, the first episode keeps the framing device of Louis being interviewed by journalist Daniel Malloy. Like the 1994 film adaptation, the series also sets the interview within the present day. Except in San Francisco, it is now in Dubai. In this version, however, Daniel is no longer a young, naive man, but an older, well-known reporter in the twilight years of his career. 
The series established that Daniel and Louis have already had the titular interview of the original book back in the 1970s, but now Louis wants to do the interview again and get the story right this time. So here we see the inclusion of the production's adaptational changes being worked into the story's framing device. To be honest, I initially wondered why they couldn't just have this new interview be the first interview, or why they couldn't include something about how Daniel and Louis never got to finish their interview and now they're here to complete what they started, which in retrospect they kind of do. By having the characters continually refer to the first interview and how Louis' account differs so much from it now seems a bit like the writers wanting to have their cake and eat it too. Almost like they were afraid fans would be so upset over all the changes, so here, let's just have Louis say his first interview was biased and unfair and that he's now giving the real, nuanced account of what went down. Like, if you're going to make the changes you have made, fine, but you don't need to try to legitimize them in the eyes of fans by having one of the main characters keep insisting that this is the quote-unquote real version. It's an adaptation, things change, we get it. You could say they kept this running meta-commentary in order to highlight the theme of remembering, or as they say, This is the odyssey of recollection. And the issue of subjective bias and remembering does come up throughout the show, with Daniel utilizing different autobiographical sources in his research. But given that he pretty much tosses the tapes from the original interview in the third episode as a goodwill gesture to Louis that they will make a fresh start of it, I'm still not entirely convinced this was all just so the writers could justify their changes of the original text by having Louis say his perspective has changed. So Daniel and Louis decide to resume their interview, and I just love the way Louis' character is introduced in the episode with his slow, haunting voiceover being heard as a face becomes superimposed over Dubai. I don't know, it has kind of this odd, old, scary movie charm to it. Also, the way he delivers his first line. You've grown old, Daniel. And just like that, Jacob Anderson perfectly encapsulates the world-weary, poetic, and tragic nature of Louis while also having a bit of his sass in that one bit of dialogue. It is so reminiscent of how I imagined Louis to be in the book, and Jacob Anderson from the get-go just understood the assignment. And yes, if it sounds like I am totally simping over Jacob Anderson, it is because I am. He is the best thing about this show, and I will die on that hill. So with this version's new interview framing device established, we flash back to 1910 New Orleans where Louis is a young man who has made his fortune from running brothels in the red light district of Storyville. Right away we see that the series will depict the realities of Louis now being a black man in early 20th century America with him being called a racial slur in his first flashback scene. We also see Louis' home life with his mother, sister Grace, and his brother Paul. Now here's one of the most notable things in this adaptation that they have actually retained from the book, which the movie removed. Louis' brother is only in the book for a short amount of time, but ends up serving a pretty significant role in Louis' decision to become a vampire. In the book, Paul comes to Louis saying he has received a vision from God and that God has told them to sell all of their land and property. Louis calls bullshit, Paul leaves, and a moment later is dead after having fallen from the balcony. No one knows if Paul slipped, if he jumped, but nevertheless, Louis blames himself, sending him into a self-destructive spiral, which makes him susceptible to Lestat's influence. In the show, they keep Paul's religious fanaticism, but here it is framed through a very 21st century retrospective understanding of mental illness. He is seen talking to things that aren't there, he says birds in his head ask him questions, and his eccentricities are kind of just accepted in his family. His death is more or less the same as it was in the book, but its impact, rather than it being the impetus for Louis' self-destructive path, here it ends up kind of being the final straw for him. And that's because, unlike his book counterpart, human Louis has a lot more he is struggling with in this series. In this version, Louis' main conflict as a human is the limitations he faces as a black man when confronted with the systemic racism of the American South. Princess Weeks touched on the implications of this in her excellent video essay, Why Are There So Many Confederate Vampires?, by highlighting how Louis' race change works as an expansion on the theme of vampirism as a metaphor for the exploitation of individuals as seen through the institution of slavery. By changing Louis' race in this adaptation and having a majority of the main characters be POC characters, it highlights not only the otherness of Lestat, the only main white character, but also places audiences within a much more sympathetic identification with Louis as a black man as opposed to white slave owner. In addition to being black, Louis is also a closeted gay man. This aspect of his character removes not only any doubt as to the nature of his relationship with Lestat, but also adds to the internal conflict he feels, reflecting not only how aspects of his identity are targeted by wider society, but within his own deeply religious family as well. 
So here, Louis' original character as a sensitive, poetic individual, while retained, is couched within a very different set of circumstances from the novel, fundamentally changing what becoming a vampire would mean for him. Instead of vampirism being a last-ditch effort for salvation in the face of a nihilistic self-destruction, here it is framed as a chance for Louis to escape the limitations his various marginalized identities place him in among society. So Lestat is introduced in a predatory position similar to the novel when Louis first meets him, but we see another adaptation change where instead of Louis and Lestat meeting and Louis turning into a vampire within the span of basically one day, here, Lestat plays the long game of wooing and courting Louis, taking him on strolls into the opera. He even meets the folks. Also, I low-key love that Louis is aware that this guy can straight up read minds and stop time, and is not until like a month into their relationship that he questions that. He's just like, I don't know, he's got tricks. <laughs> French people are weird. So here we are presented with what is probably the biggest change from the book, which is the centering of the romantic relationship between Lestat and Louis. So, quick tangent. Sexuality in Rice's works has always been kind of a complicated thing. While the vampires in her books often express intense feelings for other vampires, and sometimes even humans, these are never really depicted as explicitly sexual. Rice said that making the vampire explicitly straight or gay limits the material, and her vampires have a polymorphous sexuality where they see everything as beautiful. So because of this sexual fluidity that seems to be based more in the aesthetics rather than physical attraction, I feel like it can be easy for some to miss the romantic element of Lestat and Louis' relationship, especially in the first book when it was only subtext. But Rice has gone on the record saying they were married to each other and that Lestat and Louis are a couple in canon. Given the significance of Rice and her works in the LGBTQ community and how much prior screen adaptations have toned down or removed the queer elements of these stories, it was great that the adaptation was finally going to depict the romantic relationship between these characters. So this means that Lestat's motivation for pursuing and turning Louis while unchanged from the book is a lot more transparent in the series. So far in this episode, it is basically building upon the homoerotic subtext of Louis and Lestat's initial encounter, stretching it into an hour-long depiction of luscious gothic romance. The biggest adaptational differences, such as the different time period, the change in Louis' backstory, are all fully realized, and while I was a little disappointed that Louis' impetus for becoming a vampire was not solely based on grief, as in the novel, because I do think the novel and its use of the vampire is one of the best allegories for grief ever written, the new reasons for him becoming a vampire make sense for this iteration of the character, and I think it was really well done. So it's all going great, and the episode ends with an operatic, high-emotion scene in a church where Lestat confesses his love and offers to give Louis a dark gift under no duress to Louis whatsoever. It's a decision made with total consideration and consent by Louis. The scene is tender, yet horrific, and oh, so gothic. The episode ends with Louis telling Daniel how his transformation felt, with dialogue lifted directly from the book, and my god, is it beautiful! Jacob, please do an audiobook of Interview with the Vampire. Please! As if some enormous creature were coming through a dark and alien forest. Episode 2. So this is easily the weakest of the series because the main conflict of Louis feeling guilty about killing humans kind of comes out of nowhere. Maven does a great job analyzing this in her episode 2 and 3 recaps. In this episode, Louis has to learn the ins and outs of being a newborn vampire, that he can't drink the blood of the dead, that he can't go in the sun, and that he has to be discerning when he makes a kill. So I feel like the killing of the opera singer here would have worked much better in episode 3 after Louis has already started drinking animals like in the book. Maybe put in the scene where Lestat throws a hissy fit because his husband hooked up with another guy despite the fact he had agreed to an open marriage three scenes prior. I get that the scene is to show that Lestat is jealous and possessive, maybe as a setup for what happens in episode 5, but Having this moment in episode 3 as opposed to 2 and after Louis has started his existential guilt trip and drinking only animals I think would have worked better. As it stands, Louis's vegetarian diet just kind of comes out of nowhere because all of a sudden he suddenly feels bad that Lestat kills this one guy on this one night. The show seems like it's framing it as an epiphany thing or he felt bad about almost killing his nephew, but I don't know, that seems a little like a cop-out. After the first half of episode 2 essentially being a what-we-do-in-the-shadows style dark comedy of vampire shenanigans, it all just feels a little out of left field. Episode 3 does a much better job at conveying Louis' internal struggles and his and Lestat's conflicting ideologies on what being a vampire means. Their interactions with each other feel a lot more comfortable and organic because we don't have any scenes with Lestat giving 
How to Be a Vampire 101 Lessons for Louis and the Audience. Here we just get to see them be a couple. Louis calls out Lestat's white privilege that's funny and discerning. We get to see the fun-loving partying side of Lestat, but it's not like the haha, I enjoy being a bloodthirsty monster kind of fun-loving. It's the haha, I love showing how amazing I am and immersing myself amongst the whirl of humanity. Like, Lestat suddenly being an amazing jazz player on the piano and playing with one of the other Azalea's players just... That's so book Lestat. Louis looks on happily, everyone's enjoying themselves. The whole scene here compared to the other Lestat at the piano scene is definitely just a case study in contrasting vibe checks. The episode is also the most overt when it comes to incorporating the implications of having Louis being a black vampire in the South during this time period as he continues facing discrimination from his associates, who are now targeting his brothel, the Azalea, for foreclosure while allowing other white businesses to remain. His powers as a vampire, however, now enable him with the freedom to respond to this persecution without fear of personal violence. In very Louis fashion, however, his decisions end up biting him in the ass, and after murdering the racist antagonist Fenwick, the white citizens target the black citizens of Storyville in a horrific riot that Louis, with all of his vampiric powers, is powerless to stop. Coming upon a burning building, Louis realizes that he may not be able to save everyone, but maybe he can save just one young girl. Episode 4, Claudia's episode! Oh my god, the costume porn! Ten-year-old me wants all of the dresses, pretty cakes and dresses! Aw, where's my vampire birthday? I love Bailey Bass so much as Claudia. She is just a delight every time she is on screen and really adds a lot of charm and vulnerability to the role. She's also the character that undoubtedly is the most different from her original counterpart. This is due in part to the actress being 19 because labor laws in Louisiana wouldn't have allowed a minor to work for the hours they would have needed them to work for this character. Another part of me also thinks they might have wanted to mitigate some of the creepiness that would come from inherently seeing a younger actress in such extreme adult scenarios like murdering people or sharing a coffin with their adult co-star. So in the series, Bass plays a much older Claudia who instead of being turned when she was 5 is turned when she is 14. This radically alters Claudia's arc in the books, where she grows from being an uncomprehending, literal vampire baby who can't speak to a fully grown woman who is eternally trapped in a toddler's body. Here, instead of Claudia's frustration coming from being confined to her body, it is from being stuck as a preteen. She still retains Claudia's original zeal for killing and ravenous bloodthirsty nature, but instead of it being the result of an initial childish greediness and inability to self-restrain, here, it is more attributed to the fluctuating hormones she's stuck in now as an adolescent. The episode culminates with Claudia accidentally killing a boy named Charlie that she had been seeing, and the event is a deeply traumatic one for her. She frantically begs Lestat to turn him, Lestat is an asshole to her, and here we get the beginning of the end of Claudia and Lestat's relationship when he makes her burn Charlie's body. Episode 5 takes off recently after Charlie's death and Claudia's breakdown. Claudia has been murdering multiple people and keeping souvenirs, and now Lestat and Louis are starting to feel the heat from the cops, which I know is a nitpick, but at this point, how are people not aware of the unusually high murder rate in New Orleans? Claudia bemoans the tragedy of being eternally trapped as a child forever. Lestat, Louis, and Claudia have a big fight, and she runs away. Lestat and Louis decide to hunker down and play it safe for the next decade to avoid any more suspicion. As time progresses, their relationship deteriorates further and further, with Louis obsessing over Claudia and her whereabouts, and Lestat becoming more and more impatient and frustrated. Meanwhile, Claudia has been researching vampires and even meets one on a college campus. They bond over a racist college boy's charred body, and it is implied that this vampire character is Killer, a minor character from the Chronicles who leads a vampire biker gang. After getting a little creepy, Killer suddenly attacks Claudia, and it is implied he sexually assaults her. This is arguably the worst creative decision in the series because it is another tired and sexist example of sexual assault being used as a strengthening moment for a female character. And if you don't believe me, just watch this interview with Roland Jones. It's a horrible thing that happens to Claudia, but it has toughened her up and she ultimately comes back home. I don't think I need to say that a female character experiencing trauma does not make her more interesting and stronger, and it just feels strange that this was a decision made so that Claudia could know just how mean and evil vampires could be. Like, folks, she's lived with Lestat, she knows. So the fact that a series produced in 2022 that was so open about modernizing the material it was adapting in terms of race and sexuality did this is 
pretty depressing, and I can only hope this will be a learning moment and not something that is repeated. So afterwards, in a heartbreaking scene, Louis's sister Grace leaves with her family, severing all contact with her now distant, ageless brother and having his name placed on the family crypt. Claudia, seeing how alone and broken Louis now is, returns home to reconcile and convince him to leave with her, but uh-oh, the stat's not a fan of that. They begin to argue with Claudia, telepathically trying to convince Louis to come with her. Lestat is screaming in disbelief that Louis would just up and abandon him, and then... <sighs> Lestat begins strangling Claudia. Louis attacks Lestat, and a huge fight of vampiric proportions breaks out. The house is falling down as Claudia tries to make sense of the chaos. We then see Lestat dragging a severely beaten Louis out into the street before possessively biting into him, flying him miles up into the sky, begging Louis to admit he will never love him before dropping Louis. Claudia rushes to Louis's side, Lestat floats imperiously above them, and Claudia looks on with rage. End episode. So yeah, as you can imagine, this wasn't a controversial episode at all, and no one had a problem with it. <laughs> so this episode premiered, and this was more or less the fan reaction. A black gay man get gratuitously brutalized this way by a white man is not something anybody wants on TV right now. It was when he dragged him and took him up into the air and dropped him. I was like, this is not Lestat. Nothing, there is nothing in the world that could have prepared me for any of that. So Lestat is arguably the most popular and memorable character from Rice's work, period. So that means we got to talk about this adaptation's version of him. We have to talk about... So I haven't talked much about Lestat's character so far, but I feel like episode 5 is kind of emblematic of the biggest problem in this series, which is Lestat's character, who is... kind of a mess. I'm a lot. So this adaptation was touted as having a more complex and nuanced Lestat that is more aligned with his characterization in the rest of the Vampire Chronicles. The Lestat in this book is very different than the Lestat in this book and all the rest of the books that go forward after that. The idea of the charming vampire, uh, the brat prince, does not exist in this book. The problem is we do not have a post-interview with the vampire Lestat in Interview with the Vampire. So the only way for certain beats in this plot to work is if Lestat is framed as an antagonist. However, because this adaptation has made the decision to incorporate Lestat's backstory from the rest of the Chronicles and to foreground the romance between him and Louis, that means he can no longer be the one-dimensional villain Louis portrayed him as in the original novel. So instead of Lestat being this low-class, impetuous vampire that Louis looks down on, here he is now this mysterious, all-powerful, alluring vampire, and the relationship is just a toxic love story for the ages, a la Will Graham and Hannibal Lecter. Problem is, Claudia still has to kill a stat, Louis has to be okay with it, and these two need to book it to Europe by the end of this season, so let's make Lestat an unhinged psychopath? See, the decision to center the romance between Louis and Lestat ends up being a catch-22, because yes, while their romantic relationship has been notoriously neglected in on-screen adaptations, it was not the focus of the original novel and was subtext before becoming text in later books. By centering the romantic relationship and making it over, the dynamics between these two are just going to be fundamentally different. So plot points now play out very differently in the show as opposed to the book. We can't have Louis be the bad guy after providing this nuanced, nostalgic account of his first great vampire love and then suddenly going along with Claudia as she plots to kill Stat. So Lestat's actions have to be so horrible and unforgivable as to make Louis and Claudia's decision to kill him much more sympathetic from an audience standpoint. The problem is, this comes at the expense of Lestat's character. In a lot of interviews with Roland Jones and other series creatives, there is this emphasis that they will be showing a more nuanced and complex version of Lestat that is not in the original interview with the vampire. This made me wonder if they were going to incorporate Lestat's I only kill evildoers, mode of operandi, or maybe incorporate more of his philosophical views and his appreciation and love for humanity. Okay then. Yeah, so I don't know if sympathetic and nuanced means what Roland thinks it means, but the Lestat in this adaptation is way different from the Chronicles Lestat, and 
I would say even less sympathetic than Lestat in the original novel. And I want to quickly add that none of this criticism is directed at actor Sam Reed, who I do genuinely think did a great job with the material he was given and clearly has a deep respect and appreciation for the character, unlike other actors. <clears throat> it's really refreshing and endearing to see just how nerdy he is for this franchise. It's clear this man understands Lestat and his appeal, and the moments he gets to engage with that more irreverent, fun-loving Lestat of the books is really great to watch. I love the piano playing scene in episode 3, his facial expressions and shade in this moment. I see you have a banjo band in your front yard. Uh -huh. And the moments where he's actually tender with Louis, which are kind of sparing. See, there's a lot of surface level characterization that at first glance does make this Lestat appear very similar to his book counterpart. He's vain, temperamental, he can alternate between cruel and affectionate, he loves to have a good time, and when it comes to the people he loves, well, he is just as whipped as they come. The problem is the writers have also decided to take this character in new directions when it comes to the antagonistic role he still needs to inhabit in the service of certain plot points. So instead of Lestat just being a bastard like he is in the original book, his character is cranked to an 11 when it comes to showing his evil side. Part of me wonders if this was in part to make it more dramatically appealing for a television series, but I don't know. I feel like there's a very fine line between whitewashing Lestat and making him so evil that it alienates the audience. So rather than Lestat killing only evildoers like he does in the books, he'll kill anyone it seems, and it's Louis who has to twist his arm to give it a try one night. Instead of the contradiction of Lestat loving and treasuring humanity despite being a murderous monster, here he looks down on humans and humanity as a whole. They were your brothers and sisters once, but now they're your savory inferiors. Louis has to convince him to turn Claudia into a vampire, and Lestat basically becomes that narcissistic parent who gets jealous when their partner shows attention to their own baby. All of it culminating into what will probably be one of the most controversial decisions ever made in this franchise, which is making Lestat a f***ing domestic abuser. Before I go any further, I want to address some of the arguments that have been made to justify Lestat's actions in this scene. It's abuse. Yes, Lestat has been shown to be a violent monster in the series, but abuse is still abuse regardless of whether it is committed by two humans or two vampires. Lestat initiated the violence by attacking Claudia, who is a much younger and weaker vampire. Louis attacked Lestat so he could protect her. We see multiple times in the fight Lestat overpowering and hurting Louis. Lestat even says at one point he's trying to restrain himself. You don't want to fight like this anymore! I am trying to restrain myself! From this point on in the scene, it is pure physical domination with Louis and Claudia powerless to do anything. It's abuse. Yes, the scene is shot from Claudia's perspective, a choice that creators said was deliberate in order to show the abuse. So already you have the framing of the scene being explicitly done in order to show a moment of abuse occurring. Louis also does not contradict any of what viewers saw in the subsequent episode. So an explanation is not an excuse, and for anyone who thinks it is, all I can point out is this. Cruelty is the opposite of love. Not some inarticulate expression of it. So in the wake of the controversy surrounding this episode, there were a lot of pieces that tried to reconcile this moment in regards to where it fit in terms of adaptation and narrative fidelity. When should content warnings be applied? What does it mean to identify with characters who are monsters? What were the implications of the scene when you factor in that Lestat, a white man, is abusing two characters of color? Princess Weeks wrote an excellent piece where she says, There is this dual desire I see to want to love the monster for what they have represented, especially among the marginalized, but it also erases that some creatures live in tandem with us. A wealthy, white, powerful vampire who does not value life and has a complex relationship with love is not going to be a romantic comedy. Yes, I understand the desire for a romantic, healthy gay couple on television, but even in Anne Rice's text, they were not that. No, they certainly weren't a healthy relationship in the novel, but I think most readers would agree they were not like this. Like, Anne Rice has made it clear her feelings about violence. If she wanted to write a Dragon Ball Z level fight in the original book, there wasn't anything stopping her. The issue here is the context of this violence and how it fundamentally goes against the character she wrote. Like, sympathetic vampires have always been a thing in media. I feel like most people going into these stories can inherently accept that these vampires have killed people, without it really blocking their ability to understand or empathize with them. That was kind of why Interview with the Vampire was so groundbreaking when it was written. 
Now, the argument has been made that the Lestat in this adaptation is just a different character, and therefore his action shouldn't be compared to a book counterpart he no longer bears any resemblance to. This was kind of my thought process after seeing the episode for the first time, but now even just looking at the scene solely within the context of the series, it just… it just doesn't work. There is a jarring tonal dissonance when you have a vampire committing over-the-top, grotesque vampire violence and uncomfortably real domestic abuse as their daughter watches. So all of this goes back to how Lestat's character is depicted in this new adaptation and how the changes made to his character just kind of result in him being a mess because the series has to make him serve every possible function as this reimagining needs. He needs to be alluring and seductive, romantic and tender, evil and violent. The problem at the end of the day is that by having this scene, it shows there really isn't a line this dude won't cross and that could end up being a problem for adapting a property where he's the main character and arguably hero of this franchise. Again, I want to stress I don't need Lestat to be stripped of monstrous or negative qualities in order for him to be relatable. He does plenty of monstrous things in the book, but there were still lines he wouldn't cross. Like it or not, I feel like Tom Cruise's portrayal of Lestat was able to convey both the sympathetic and evil qualities of Lestat, probably because the screenplay was written by Anne Rice without the need to up the ante by having him brutally beating those he supposedly loves. Like, I'm sorry, but Book Lestat is nothing if not an engaging character because he is ultimately human in his fears, weaknesses, and beliefs, despite his evil and irreverence. Lestat in this series risks becoming dangerously one-dimensional and unengaging because he's just a selfish and toxic and nihilistic asshole. Like, I don't… <laughs> I don't like this guy. He is a menace and must be stopped. <laughs> I. I want Louis and Claudia to get away. Please, yes, please kill him and run. Why are you running? Why are you running? It has come to this. I am criticizing the series for making Lestat too unlikable. So this brings me finally to my last point, which is if Lestat doesn't value human life anymore, if he resents Claudia basically from day one, if he doesn't love and respect Louis enough to not beat him to a pulp, then what the f does this guy value? I don't know, but I'm sure season 3 will retcon everything and show how Lestat was really the victim the whole time. Eh, well, wouldn't be the first time. Episode 6. We begin with Louis recovering from the fight. Claudia is taking care of him and Lestat has disappeared. Probably to go complain to Antoinette. Apparently, I'm a passive-aggressive, controlling and manipulative psychopath whose narcissistic behavior drives other people crazy. Right away, Lestat begins pulling the classic abuser's remorse card and offers gifts to Louis and Claudia over six years, begging them to take him back, saying he doesn't want to be that guy anymore. The episode also confirms that apparently these three have no neighbors. Perhaps we should let him decide if he wants to see me or not. The final straw comes when Lestat sends Louis an original song he composed that features Antoinette's voice. So, quick edit, I realize I did not introduce Antoinette's character in this video. In the novel, the character's name was Antoine, and he was a musician and Lestat's lover before Lestat turned him. In the show, the character was changed to Antoinette, and she is now a singer. Louis confronts Lestat in a rage before they order Antoinette out and begin having hate makeup sex as Louis beats Lestat. What the hell is wrong with y'all? Louis and Claudia take Lestat back under new rules that are made in order to create a more equitable dynamic between the three vampires, but unfortunately, the wounds run too deep and old resentments and power dynamics flare up again. This episode ends up being more or less a filler that brings the three characters back to where they were at the end of episode 5, with Claudia and Lestat hating each other's guts and Louis paralyzed by inaction. Although not quite so literally in this episode. The only addition really being the fact that Lestat has not killed Antoinette and has promised to kill her. But hey, if you were worried that they were making Lestat's character too evil, we get this scene with Lestat stopping Claudia from escaping to Europe. The episode ends with Louis and Claudia committing to their plan to kill Lestat. Meanwhile, in the present, Daniel has a dream about his first meeting with Louis in San Francisco in 1974, where <gasps> Rashid appears? Episode 7, the season 1 finale. It was great. I can say without a doubt, this was the best episode of the series, perfectly encapsulating the gothic macabre beauty of Rice's original text, with enough new changes to make it feel fresh. The suspense over Lestat's impending murder is built up really well. Lestat gets a beautiful speech here that actually feels on brand for the character. His death is appropriately operatic and tragic. 
I will see it once and no more. Jacob, please do an audiobook. He lay now on his back, his eyes staring wildly at the ceiling, the irises dancing from side to side. All of this before the ending is able to question Louis' reliability as a narrator before dropping this twist on us. Which, okay, most fans saw coming pretty early on, but was still great. I'd like you to meet the vampire Armand. The love of my life. I also love how Louis says the love of my life like he's being held at gunpoint. Well, he's not Louis if he's not under the control of some abusive narcissist. We get our final shot of Louis and his new murder husband. Daniel's realizing he's spending at least another seven episodes in this high-rise, and cut to black. End season. Good adaptation show. You've done a good adaptation. I know the majority of this video discussed the changes this adaptation made and how well they worked, but it does still retain the main plot points of the first half of the book. Louis is a depressed and alienated individual. Lestat is a vampire who falls in love with Louis and turns him. They are fundamentally incompatible due to their different outlooks. A little girl named Claudia is turned in an attempt to save their relationship. Claudia starts to hate Lestat and kills him before leaving with Louis for Europe. That's basically the key events for the first half of the story, and the show does keep those, but the meanings of these events change when the context in which they come about is for radically different reasons, ultimately changing the characters and their motivations. The teaser for season 2 looks like it will more or less be keeping with this adaptation's prerogative of keeping significant characters and events from the book while changing the context in which these moments occur. As I have pointed out, changing the context for how some events unfold can sometimes dilute or contradict some of the original story's themes and characters, while others heighten it. And really, given that we have already had a pretty faithful film adaptation, I don't think I would have wanted another adaptation that was faithful to a fault. And as the series continues past the point of the original novel, I can only believe that it will become more daring and ambitious with its adaptational changes, which I think is cool. As a fan, I'm ready to be surprised. So ultimately, what can we take away from the show and all of its creative liberties? Well, it means we're in a new era for the Vampire Chronicles and Anne Rice's works as a whole, and that's great. Again, we need to remember the desert that has come before this and how I think this series has really been the much needed update this franchise has needed, appealing to both fans and new viewers alike. This new series has not only given us an explicitly queer relationship, an important theme within a lot of vampire stories that is often relegated to subtext, but also an incredible POC cast portraying some of the most famous vampire characters in fiction. I think for the most part, a lot of the adaptational changes were done really well in this series with my main grievance regarding Lestat's character, ultimately one which will end up being assuaged or validated depending how subsequent seasons pan out, with his character development ultimately remaining to be seen. I realize other fans may have entirely different reception to this work, and I completely respect that. This is a franchise whose story and characters have meant a lot to so many people, and I don't think there was ever going to be an adaptation, no matter how faithful, that would have satisfied everyone. That said, I do get the sense that the cast and creatives understand and respect the monumental importance of this franchise, and that they do want to do it justice. The novel is out there, fans will always have the novel, that movie in 1994, very popular with a lot of people, always there. AMC tasked me with trying to make this third thing. Rice's novel, like the vampire, will always be immortal, but I think it's important to remember that as her vampires realize, a vampire cannot endure immortality if it remains unchanging. <laughs>